six years ago, the first float conference that ever happened was in Denver. So we've in many ways come full circle, and Tom Fine and I were having dinner last night and talking about that first float conference where the keynote speakers were John Lilly and Jay Shirley. Could you imagine that? And having this in the background, I think, is a, a perfect format for this event, um, commemorating the full circle here in Denver. So today I'm going to give you guys a few updates. I feel like every year the past few years I've been dumping a lot of data on you. So I'm not going to overwhelm you with data this time, I promise. But I am going to give you some updates. And <clears throat> I think one of the important things to, to recognize as we're going through these updates is research is a constantly evolving process. Whenever you get data, then the next step is replicate it, right? That's part of the scientific process. And I think we're starting to get there as a field of floating. Now, I come from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it was really weird getting off the plane yesterday because it's a direct flight. Normally, I would get off in Denver and then catch my connecting flight to Portland. I almost accidentally went to a Portland flight. <laughs> but it's great to be here. And we're celebrating, actually, a major anniversary of floating. Does anyone know what happened 50 years ago? And it's linked to floating intimately. The first man on the moon. How many here knew that all the astronauts in training in the race to the moon were also floating? So in 1957, after spending a few years with Dr. John Lilly at the National Institute of Mental Health, Jay Shirley moved to my state of Oklahoma and built a fully immersive float tank in an eight-foot vat of water where you're connected to breathing tubes and wearing maybe one of the scariest helmets I've ever seen. <laughs> and floating vertically for many hours at a time. And as you can imagine, not many people volunteered for this research study. But lo and behold, NASA was actually doing confidential research that never got reported in all the astronauts in training to the moon. And they weren't just sending their male astronauts. In fact, they were sending their female astronauts, too. And a book came out not too long ago called Promise the Moon. And the female astronauts were actually outlasting the males twofold in Dr. Shirley's float tank. Many of them could last, you know, 10 or so hours in this environment. The males were getting out at about five hours. So I always think if NASA was taking this data seriously, it should have been a woman on the moon first, not a male. And there he is, Dr. Shirley in his room. You could kind of see a tape recorder. That, that tape recorder was actually just recording people's stream of consciousness. He was a Freudian. And he was just listening as they would sit there for hours talking to themselves in this vat of water. So we've obviously come a long ways since those days in floating, and we're very lucky to have people like Glenn Perry, who moved us away from this design of the float tank into what we all know now. But there's another moonshot I want to present today, and it involves this moon. It's actually a dwarf planet. Does anyone know what this is? It's floating in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. It's a little dwarf planet called Ceres, that's right. And you see that, uh, you see this little area of light colored brightness? That's one of the world's biggest pools of magnesium sulfate. So I think to myself, as Elon Musk is getting ready to, to try to fly to Mars, if he could just go a little further, maybe he could drop us off on Ceres with some water and we could have the world's biggest float pool. So here's the moonshot. 
it's this idea that we all have knowledge and experiential access to this unique technology of floating, but the world of medicine, the world of science has mostly not heard of it. We're still in the early days. And so this idea of a float research collective is really about trying to establish a science of floating and to do this with a whole collection of researchers. And obviously this could be a, a major educational resource for the float industry. And as part of this collective, there was a website that came out last year, clinicalfloat.com, and it contains a repository of all the peer-reviewed studies that have come out in the domain of clinical floating. So it's just there as a resource for other scientists, for people who are just genuinely interested in floating to learn about it. But beyond that, we need more researchers. And we need more replication in our research. That's the essence of science, right? As you do an experiment, and then someone else somewhere could replicate it. And anything we do at my institute will have to be replicated. I don't think anyone in Western medicine is gonna take work from one individual laboratory and assume that it's just going to work. So this is actually a very important part of disseminating the research, is getting other researchers to actually try out the experiment again. And then as a long shot, every day around the world, there's probably thousands of people floating in your centers. Imagine if we could collect thousands of data points. That would be really exciting. We could learn things at a much larger scale. So one of the things that I'm most excited about is the past year has actually changed the landscape for the research collective quite a bit. So we have my lab in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and most of our focus is on mental health. We work with patients who have anxiety and depression, women with anorexia nervosa, people with PTSD. At the same time, over the past uh, two decades, research has been happening at Karlstad University in, in Sweden. And their work has really focused on stress-related pain, Burnout, insomnia is a new area of study they're, they're heading in. But for the past 20 years, that was it. There really wasn't a lot more research happening in the world of floating. And as you can imagine, standing here, it was quite lonely. You're sitting on series, no one else is studying this. Well, let's go through what has happened over the past year. To me, one of the most exciting things is another full circle. Dr. Tom Fine has convinced the powers that be that floating needs to come back to the University of Toledo. And over the course of the next year, he will be building a new float clinic in the hospital, and their studies are going to really focus on addiction and chronic pain, amongst other things. In Hanover, in Germany, uh, Florian Beisner is actually studying floating in patients who have chronic pain, and he's scanning their brains. And there's a clinical trial that's been going on for the past two years, and hopefully in the next year or two, he'll be able to finish that, and I'm gonna try to get him to come out to this conference. This year, you're gonna hear from Dr. Josh Hagen, who just opened a, a, a float clinic at West Virginia University. And one of the areas he's gonna be studying is concussion and TBI, which I think is a very low-hanging fruit, yet absolutely no empirical research yet in this population. So we're finally going to get data looking at this. When I was at RISE this year, Float STL had been avidly reaching out to Washington University, and they've established a collaboration to study mindfulness in floating, and that study is just getting ready to launch. Chapman University in California just built a brain institute and they're very interested in studying floating. They have a float tank. And they're going to look at this in terms of consciousness and also brain processes. Lydia Codwell at Ohio State uh, spoke a few years ago about some of the research she's doing with exercise science. But I'm really excited this year. We got Dr. Matt Driller to come out from New Zealand. And he's going to talk about the elite athletes he's been floating and how it's helped with performance enhancement and recovery from exercise.
And then I just heard last week from the folks at Float Milwaukee and Andy Larson who have reached out to the local researchers at the Medical College of Wisconsin and have just received approval to do a study at their center looking at trauma and PTSD. So in one year's time, it went from being very lonely on this planet of series to look at, we actually have the beginnings of a collective of scientists who are trying to study this, trying to understand its benefits, and doing you know, quite a range of different types of research. I think this is, to me, maybe the most exciting update I have to report to you this year. Now, all this research, keep in mind, is happening within the context of what I think is really a cultural experiment. All of us are living as human guinea pigs, right? Being the first generation exposed to smart technology. How many of you have looked at the, the data from your phone to tell you how many hours a week you're using it? I see a lot of people who are scared to look at their, their use data. <laughs> well, guess what? A lot of us are actually on our phones more than 40 hours a week. Could you have imagined 10, 15 years ago before smartphones came out, I would tell you this story that in the next few decades, there's going to be this little box that you're going to hold. And for about a full-time job each week, you're going to just be interacting with it. Would that sound weird? Well, we're doing it. And in many ways, floating, I would say, is the antidote to this crazy cultural experiment that we're all undergoing. And the ramifications of what's happening with technology, we just don't know yet. We're learning. Each year, a world happiness report gets published. And I always like to read it, because what they do in this is they go around the world and they give the same measures to different societies. And they try to understand each country in terms of levels of happiness. And they also try to look at you know, what is happening to happiness over time in society. And so I just want to share a few slides of data from the World Happiness Report of 2019. So this is the first thing. Over the past decade, as you could see, internet use has just spiked. But at the same time, the amount of t hours of, of sleep that we're getting, the amount of social interaction we're having with real people, not just virtual people in our social networks, and our actual happiness is plummeting. They looked at over 150 different countries and looked at the change in happiness over the past 10 to 15 years. And they ranked it. And guess where the United States is? Our country. We, uh, we came in in 112th place. We're right behind Zambia and a few countries ahead of Afghanistan. So if you had to summarize how the state of happiness is in America, I would say we're not doing too well. Zambia and Afghanistan, and we're right in the middle. Meanwhile, anxiety and depression is escalating. It affects over a quarter of the whole population. It's the leading cause of disability worldwide. The World Health Organization actually came out last year and and stated so. Three quarters of patients are not getting treatment. Only about half are improving with the current treatments. And the outcomes are not great, even with the best gold standard treatments. Suicide has risen 30% since the turn of the millennium. And in teenagers and millennials, the ones who are using the technology more than anybody else, Suicide rates have doubled in the past decade. This is scaring a lot of mental health professionals when you see these suicide changes. When you ask the millennials, what are the biggest problems that your peers are facing? 
70% of them said the major problem is anxiety and depression, much more so than bullying and drug addiction and alcoholism. It's anxiety and depression. And then when you look at what we're using to treat anxiety and depression, it's often drugs, and these drugs are highly addictive. Benzodiazepines, alcohol, opiates, ketamine. These have become how we treat anxiety and depression, and in many ways, they've become a replacement. And everything that's happening right now in our society with the opioid crisis is intimately linked to this story. Over half of the opiate prescriptions go to people who have mental health issues. It's all linked. So it's within this context that last year I presented some ideas, some theories about how floating could help, and we received the first NIH grant to study this. And this is it. This is the, the, the grant we got, investigating flotation rest as a novel technique for reducing anxiety and depression. And it wasn't just me. I, I wrote the grant, but we have a great team of people who are part and parcel of this research. And without them, none of this could happen. And in fact, you're going to be hearing from Flux uh, probably tomorrow talking about some of the work he's been doing. And he'll be actually spending some of his dissertation really focused on the data in this grant. Now, in terms of grants, you have to understand this is how research is funded in America. If you don't get grant money, you can't do research. It's, it's our bread and butter. So the fact that NIH was willing to finally support float research after 60 years of other scientists trying to get grant money, I think this is a major change, which means other researchers could now come into the field and the door is open. They're willing to support this research to understand the benefits of floating. And all of the research we're going to be doing in this grant takes place in our open pool. This was an act, absolutely brilliant uh, work from Colin Stanwell Smith from Float Away, who spent about half a year living with me and his wife Ginny as well, helping me build this laboratory to study floating in patients who normally would never try this. And I could tell you, had I not gone the route of an open pool, I don't think a single patient with severe anxiety would have even tried to be in my study. This was the key part to getting the patients to actually float, is you have to get rid of the enclosure. I have nothing at all against, with float, against float tanks that have enclosures. I think they, they serve a great purpose. But I think what a lot of people don't recognize is it creates a huge barrier to entry. A lot of the patients just refuse to float if there's an enclosure. And even the average, normal, healthy human beings out there, the enclosure creates a barrier. And it's something I think everyone needs to think about as you're creating your own business around this. If you have an enclosure, you're going to have a major barrier to entry. Now, when you do a clinical trial, you have to have a good control condition. Everything is based off of this. And so we've been devising different ways to quote unquote, control for the effects of floating. And I don't know if any one control condition is going to be perfect, but the one that we're using in this study involves what's known as a zero gravity chair. You could buy these and relax the back stores. They're very comfortable. And more or less what we're trying to do is control for the effects of simple relaxation. What are you able to do in the comfort of your own home if you're laying in a nice environment you have minimal pressure on your spinal cord. You're alone in a quiet and dark room. No one's distracting you. And how are the benefits of floating any different than that? So that's the control condition we're, we're actually using in this study. Now, we call it the float chair. And part of the reason is we're trying to control for the expectancy effects. We want people to, to actually view this as part and parcel of the treatment. But unfortunately, it's not exactly like floating, right? So you're not fully controlling for the expectancy effects. But last year, I had the opportunity to meet uh, folks from Italy who have designed, I think, a very interesting uh, modality that involves dry floating. 
in this zero body bed, and it's a thin layer of PVC material on top of a bed of water heated to the same exact temperature as the water in the flow pool. And instead of being like a water bed where you're kind of on top bouncing around, you, you immerse into the material and it gives you the feeling as if you're floating. And in many ways, the only difference between this, if it's in, say, a room that has reduced light and sound and properly controlled temperature, the only difference between this and the actual intervention is are you immersed in the water or are you on top of the water? So I think this has some potential benefits as a control condition, but once again, it's a highly active control condition. You're doing a lot of the same things that floating involves, minus the act of being in the water itself. And we're going to start exploring this in the clinical trial as well. So in terms of the grant, we have two primary aims. And NIH viewed this grant as sort of a stepping stone to a much larger grant, which is known as an R01. So an R34 sort of gives you enough preliminary data to support whether it's worth pursuing this at a larger scale level. So the sort of questions they want us to answer are very basic questions. Determine the feasibility, the tolerability, the safety, and the impact of preference for delivering floating in a future randomized controlled trial. They want to know, can patients with relatively severe anxiety and depression tolerate floating multiple sessions? If they could, okay, great news. Maybe we could actually do a large-scale clinical trial, but show us that they could tolerate it. Show us that they're not having adverse events while they're floating. And that's a key part to getting money and funding to do the larger-scale study. And then the secondary aim, which is obviously the question that we're most interested in, is really about the efficacy of floating. What happens over the both short-term windows of, say, one to two days post-float, and then what happens in the long term when you follow these patients six weeks and six months later? Are they still feeling some of the benefits of floating? So those are the aims of the study. That's it. And the way we set this up, it's, a, it's about a two to three year clinical trial, is there's three arms. We start with 75 patients. They go through a baseline procedure, and then they get randomized to what I call the prescribed float group, where they get six sessions, one hour a session each week. We also have the prescribed control group, the zero gravity chair, same exact setup as the float condition. And then we set up a third group, where we call it the preferred group, where they get to dictate how long they float for, up to two hours, and how frequently they float for. So if they want to float every day, they could do it. If they want to float every other week, they could do it. It's up to them, and it's going to give us some sense in this patient group, what is their preference? So before we set up the larger scale clinical trial, we could first learn what is the patient's actual preference. We don't know yet. And so, as you can see, it's a, it's a relatively small clinical trial in a hard-to-reach target population. I could tell you working with patients who have severe anxiety, it's very difficult to get them out of the house. A lot of the patients I work with have agoraphobia, which means they have trouble leaving their bedroom. Anything outside of their space of comfort is going to be anxiety-inducing. And so we have to find a way to actually get them to come out and float at least six times over the course of six or so weeks. And that's a key part of the study. That's one of our primary outcomes. We have a pretty strict set of inclusion and exclusion criteria for the study, and we are allowing people who are currently in psychotherapy or currently taking medications so long as they're stably medicated. And we are excluding for people who have relatively severe psychopathology, so we're not letting people in who have, say, bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. And all of these people are naive to floating. They've, for the most part, have never floated before. And we're collecting a whole slew of measurements, but let me draw you to the, the main ones, the primary and the secondary outcomes. How many sessions out of the six float sessions do they actually complete? That's the primary outcome. NIH 
wants to see, can these patients actually tolerate six flows? What kind of adverse events are happening and how does that, say, differ from our, our control condition? And what is the dropout rate? So my sense is, if we could answer those three outcomes in a positive manner, NIH is actually going to be willing to support a much larger scale trial to look at efficacy, which is really what all the other measures are starting to get at. And I didn't want to just measure self-report. I, I figured you have a really hard to find group of patients that are oftentimes uh, uh, resistant to other types of treatments. While we have them, let's collect a bunch of other measures. And we're also going to be collecting biosamples. This is going to be part of, of Flux's dissertation. And one of the neat parts of this is there's so many things you could do now with blood that you couldn't do even five years ago. So one of the things is we're not just going to be measuring sort of baseline inflammation across CRP and various cytokines, but we're going to be challenging the blood itself and exposing it to what's called LPS, or endotoxin. So we'll take a blood sample, we'll put it in a tube that's coated with this challenge, and we could actually see how the immune cells are reacting to this. So we could actually test two questions. Does floating affect baseline inflammation? And does floating affect the way your immune system reacts to stress? And I think that latter question may hold a lot of interesting data that um, really explores what floating is doing. We'll also be collecting uh, cortisol measures, and then I'm sure a lot of you are interested in this, but uh, we'll be collecting magnesium and looking at not just the effects of a single float, which is a, what a lot of our earlier studies did, but what happens to magnesium levels over the course of many floats. And it's a pretty uh, time-intensive study. This is an, an individual uh, uh, sort of graph of what a subject's going to go through when they're in this clinical trial. So in total, it takes about 33 hours of somebody's time to complete this study. And they float for uh, six sessions. They have pre and post uh, uh, measurements. And then they also get follow-up at six weeks and six months. And so normally, when you go into a float center, if you were to, say, purchase six float sessions, how much would that cost at your center? So you're hearing numbers anywhere from, you know, three, four hundred dollars. The patients in our study don't pay anything. We're a nonprofit research institute. We care about the science of floating. But we actually pay them two hundred and fifty dollars to do this study because they're going to be collecting a bunch of blood work. They're going to be doing various tasks and they're filling out a lot of questionnaires. So that's also part of this is they don't have to pay. We're actually paying them to do this study. Anyone want to volunteer? <laughs> Got to come to Tulsa. And we're going to answer other questions too, like does floating enhance interoception? Does it increase your distress tolerance? Does it reduce markers of inflammation and stress? Does it increase magnesium levels? So above and beyond some of the basic data that we're getting for NIH, we're going to begin to start exploring some of these other issues. And I would say it's going to take probably about two to three years to complete the study. And maybe next year we may be able to, to give you a peek at some of the preliminary pilot data that we've collected in this. So I want to kind of shift gears for a second and go back to something I presented on a few years ago, which is our initial work trying to understand how floating is impacting the brain. And actually, one of the things that struck me about uh, Glenn and Lee's talk is they were talking about the default mode. And you could actually see there's the default mode right there and right there. Those are the two hubs of the default network. And we've begun to explore how floating actually impacts this state. And uh, we're, we're working on a paper now. I can't tell you too much about it, but it's a major follow-up to the presentation a few years ago. 
And maybe next year I'll be able to present on this. But I do want to give you an update on another imaging study we did. And remember, the way we set this up is it was all in healthy subjects. We started with a group of about 50 participants. They had their brain scanned for about 90 minutes, and then they were randomized to either float in the pool or float in the chair for 90 minutes. And over the course of several weeks, they had three uh, float sessions to just acclimate. We didn't want to scan their brains right away because then we'd be just basically measuring novelty effects, right? So what they did is they had three sessions to acclimate, and then immediately after the third float session or the third chair session, they had their brain scanned again. And we did this task called the Monetary Incentive Delay Task. And essentially what happens in this paradigm is you're presented with a little circle and then it could say something like $5. And that means that if you press a button fast enough, you're actually going to win $5. And at the end of the study, they would do multiple rounds of this, we would pay them. So you're, you're actually winning this money. It could also say something like, you know, minus $5, which means if you don't press the button quick enough, you'll end up losing the $5. Or as a control condition, it could also say zero, which means even if you don't press the button quick enough, you're not going to gain or lose any money. And then this triangle comes on screen, and that's when you're supposed to press the button. And if you do it quick enough, you could get the money. So that's how the task works. It's really trying to look at What's going on in the brain as you're anticipating the receipt of an award, a reward? And the area of the brain that seems to be most responsive to this is buried deep in the middle, and it's called the nucleus accumbens. It's highly rich in dopamine. Nearly every drug of abuse will activate this area, as will anything that's rewarding, whether it's food or sex. And so previous work that's looked at this has found that at those $5 rewards where you really up the ante, that's where the nucleus accumbens really starts to activate. And so the prediction was quite simple. Those who would float in the pool condition would show further enhancement of activation within their nucleus accumbens. So, boy, this must have been three or four years ago at the float conference, I presented some of the early data on this. We now have more or less the complete results, and I'll take you through it. And just keep in mind, we're doing the brain scans at pre and post float. We are not scanning the brain during the float, but if anyone knows how to do that, come see me. I would love to. We just don't have an MRI machine that's compatible with the float tank. Not yet. But Colin could, could potentially resolve that. So let's start with pre-float. What's going on? So there's the nucleus accumbens. We extracted the signal from this specific region of the brain. And we look at it separately in the left and the right hemisphere. So I'll kind of be presenting that. And just as a color code, the green bars represent what happens in the nucleus accumbens during the $5 uh, re reward anticipation, and the white bars are when they didn't have any money uh, to win on that trial. So that's what it looks like pre-float in both the chair and the pool groups. And essentially, there's no differences. At baseline, both the chair condition and the pool condition, as you would expect, is uh, finding a significant activation within the nucleus accumbens to the $5 reward. So let's move to post-float. What we found post-float actually supported the hypothesis. A significant increase in both the left and the right nucleus accumbens to the $5 reward condition, above and beyond the people in the chair condition. And when you look at, say, comparing this to the loss condition, when you could lose $5, there was no difference. It was really specific to the positive aspects of the reward 
it wasn't changing from pre to post float for the punishment side. So let me just kind of show you that again. You see a significant enhancement post float to the $5 reward and essentially no change to the negative $5. And when you compare uh, the self-report ratings post float and look at a measure of happiness on the PANAS, essentially what we found is the degree to which floating improved your happiness was correlated with the degree to which your nucleus accumbens signal was being elevated post-float. And the opposite was actually happening in the chair condition. So I think this is really fascinating data providing some really clear evidence that floating is impacting an area of the brain that's highly involved in reward processing and in motivation. Patients who have, say, severe depression have what's known as anhedonia. It's one of the worst symptoms of depression. Things that are normally pleasurable no longer bring you pleasure. And when they do this same exact task in the MRI scanner with people who have depression, Guess what happens to their nucleus accumbens? It's blunted, it's barely activated. And after they get better with treatment, you start seeing the signal rise. So I think there's some evidence here that we're impacting this very deep circuitry that's involved in our sense of positivity in, re in reward processing and in motivation. Now, moving into the body, one of the things I presented last year is this highly significant reduction in blood pressure, especially diastolic blood pressure. Within 10 to 15 minutes, everyone we've ever tested seems to be dropping anywhere from 10 to 15 points. And we're not seeing anything like that in our control conditions. And so one of the things we've started to explore is does the degree to which your blood pressure changes in the float actually relate to how it's affecting your emotions and your mood. And we did find an association that I think is interesting. Flux is gonna present a lot more about this tomorrow, but to just kind of take you through this, this is all the data points of blood pressure that we gathered. And what you find in this left graph is as diastolic blood pressure drops, so does your state anxiety. And in the right graph, as your diastolic blood pressure drops, your serenity increases. And so when we looked across all the different measures that we collected, whether it be heart rate, heart rate variability, or things like blood pressure, or even respiration, it was the blood pressure signal that seemed to be relating most heavily to changes in anxiety levels and serenity. And so we're getting ready to write this up now and try to understand how the bodily changes are actually impacting the emotional changes. I think this is important, though. About two years ago, they changed the definition of hypertension. It went from 140 over 90 to 130 over 80, which means millions of people who are mostly healthy are now going to have a pretty severe diagnosis. You don't want to have hypertension. It's one of the biggest predictors of cardiovascular disease and stroke. So if it's true that you could drop, say, 10 to 15 points, and your blood pressure's you know, in the 130 over 80 range, you could take someone who's hypertensive and bring them into a normotensive range. And instead of having to medicate them, which is what's happening right now in our population at a massive scale, people are on blood pressure medications. It's one of the biggest drugs on the market. You might be able to do this naturally. So is there any evidence to support this? Well, you could go back to the 1983 meeting, and I bet you Tom was up here talking about this research where he took a group of patients who had hypertension floated them continuously for four months, and found that four months later, they were no longer hypertensive. And if this could be replicated in a larger sample, I think this could be a very useful way to envision floating for more than just people who have mental health issues. 
There's a lot of people who have hypertension. And that's a low-hanging fruit. And the blood pressure f effects of floating, I could tell you, are the biggest effects that we're seeing in our physiological data. There's another thing that came out actually just a few months ago. It's known as the ICD-11. This is more or less the Bible for doctors around the world. It lists every single medical condition that's out there and the symptoms that are involved in it. And for the first time, the ICD-11 put burnout as a condition. And for those who don't know what it is, this is their definition. A syndrome conceptualized as resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed, characterized by feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion, increased mental distance from one's job, feelings of negativism or cynicism related to the job, and reduced professional efficacy. You know, I talk to my colleagues in psychiatry and psych uh, psychology about burnout, and some of them actually laugh and they say, well, isn't that life? Is that really what life has come to? We all have to live in this burnt out way? And some of the clearest data we've seen from the Swedish group is floating could really help with burnout. So now that this is listed in the ICD-11, someone could get a diagnosis and insurance companies starting in around 2022 are gonna be able to reimburse for burnout. That's an exciting moment potentially for floating. And I really believe that the sooner insurance companies get data to support floating's benefit, the sooner they're actually gonna be willing to pay for everyone to float at your centers. Could you imagine all those weekday floats during the say mornings or afternoons where the tanks are normally wide open, right? You're gonna have patients with pretty severe disabilities and medical issues coming into float and they're not gonna have to pay anything. And that could be five or 10 years away. You know, two months ago, I actually got a chance to visit Australia. And I was really fortunate to have uh, Tony Basil there on the left who hosted me. She's the head of the Float Therapy Association of Australia. And then some of you might remember Nick Dunn, and he was here a few years ago at the float conference. But I got a chance to actually see floating in Australia. And I could tell you, they're even more ahead of the game than America. The disability organizations in Australia are already reimbursing patients who are floating. In fact, I met a patient who had over two months of float sessions completely covered retroactively because of their disability. And so I think this is sort of a preview of what is going to happen in the future. More and more of the medical providers and the health insurance companies are going to start reimbursing for floating. But once again, that is all contingent on the data. We have to show floating is effective. And the whole uh, uh, trip out to Australia was really centered around the International Mental Health Conference, where they invited me to come give a keynote talk. And once again, Australia is extremely progressive because there hasn't been any mental health conferences that have invited me in America to give a keynote talk. But what I can tell you is they were very open to the idea that floating could help their patients. And a lot of the patients are sick of the medications. That was sort of a theme I, I, I learned during the trip. So maybe we could actually look to Australia as a model of what could be happening already in America. We just need to accelerate it a little bit. And so I had an idea, I said, you know, maybe we could start creating studies that could really leverage the potential of floating as an effective intervention above and beyond, say, medication. And the one medication that I keep thinking about is really what I would say is the harbinger of what's to come. It's what I refer to as the next opiate crisis, benzodiazepines. These are drugs like Xanax or Ativan or Valium that are prescribed at a monumental level, making billions of dollars a year. And over the past decade, the number of benzo prescriptions has doubled. 
And as of last year, one in eight Americans is taking a benzo. Now, I have nothing against a drug that could help you feel better. But guess what one of the main side effects of benzodiazepines are? You're physiologically addicted to it. In other words, you could be taking the drug exactly as your doctor prescribes it. And then when you try to get off of it, you cannot. Just like with opiates, right? It's the same issue. The, the, the immense physiological addiction. And it's very dangerous. If you try to come off cold turkey, you could actually die. You could have delirium tremens. You could have seizures. So we're giving people prescriptions at a monumental rate of a drug that's just like the opiates. And I could tell you a lot of the overdoses that are happening now with the opiates are often people who are both using the opiates and the benzos together. And when you ask the patients who are taking benzos and misusing it, meaning they're taking it more often than the doctor recommends or taking it for a longer period of time, why are you doing that? This is what they say. 46% say they do it because they want to feel relaxed and they want to relieve muscle tension. 22% is to help them with sleep. About 11% is to help with emotions. Does anyone in this room know of some modality that could help relax, relieve muscle tension, improve sleep? Is there something else that might be able to do this that won't cause you to have an immense physiological addiction? Well, I presented data last year showing that in this group of patients, many of whom had tried benzodiazepines, floating could significantly drop their state anxiety levels into a normative range. And that was a single float session. And then we followed them for about 24 hours and even a day later, they're still feeling the benefits. With the typical benzo, it's usually about four to eight hours later where the anxiety starts re-emerging. So what an interesting idea. We could do a head-to-head -head study where we take the same patient and we float them, or we prescribe to them a standard benzodiazepine, and we track their anxiety levels pre to post float, or pre to post benzo, and we track it over the course of several days. And when we get that data, now a doctor could go to a patient who's struggling with anxiety, struggling with sleep, and say, you know, I could hand you this prescription pad, and you could take this pill, or here's an alternative that doesn't require something that you could potentially get addicted to that will have the same effect. And I think it's those sorts of studies where you do head-to-head -head competition within the same subject, something known as a within-subject crossover design, that is going to get Western medicine to start taking floating seriously. But in order to do that study, we have to fund it. And I could tell you, Big Pharma is probably not very happy about funding this study. So over the course of the next year, one of my goals is actually to start raising money actually conduct this study. Would that be something you guys would be interested in, in helping with? You know, the, to me, these are the sort of studies that are so quintessential because until you do those head-to-head -head comparisons, the average doctor is going to say, oh, it's probably just a placebo. It's probably snake oil. It's probably one of these other things out there that helps people, they think, but it actually isn't helping them at all. Well, if you could show them objective data in a head-to-head -head competition with something that is beating the placebo, like a benzo, then you could actually start convincing the doctors. So my hope is over the next year or two, we'll be able to raise enough money to actually do this head-to-head -head study. And with that, I'd like to thank my colleagues who I work with every day, I want to especially uh, thank Dr. Kalsa, my, my partner in crime, and all of this research. And I look forward to the future of float research. Thank you. Uh,